Nicholas Figures reporting here with Shelby County Commissioner Heidi Schaefer. And um, I received a, um, a booklet from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II regarding her Diamond Jubilee. And could you please express your support for Queen Elizabeth II regarding this booklet and her Diamond Jubilee? And could you please um, show to the international community what she extended to me? Mr. Schaefer. Well, I just thought this was very lovely. It's the, the program from her Diamond Jubilee, and you can see it's Elizabeth II, and I believe the R stands for Rex. She began her reign in 1952, and it shows that her Diamond Jubilee is in 2012. Mm -hmm. And if you open it up, you see her on her coronation day and some pictures throughout the years. And there she is in her royal regalia. And it's from Buckingham Palace, and it says, I send you my grateful thanks for the words of support which you have so kindly sent on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of my accession to the throne. Elizabeth, 2012. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner Heidi Schaefer. You know, you know it was a complete honor to receive this from, um, from Queen Elizabeth II, and it, it was just um, amazing to me. So um, as a, you know, the youngest Shelby County Unified School Board applicant, I'm just honored, and I will continue to fight and um, help my generation to be inspired in public service. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer. And happy 2012 just Diamond Jubilee to Her Majesty. Portrait in the front hall of Daisy Mallory, who was the last resident. Uh, and she had the foresight to actually leave the house con complete with its contents. Uh, and it's now part of the Memphis Museum Systems. And it's such a wonderful thing to go through and see furniture that was bought at the World's Fair and that was purchased particularly to go in a certain place in the house. It's not things that have been put back in, but you really get the sense of how people lived and what the bay in the parlor was like and where the musicians might have stood while they played for dinner parties. Uh, and that's very rare. I can only think of a few other houses in the United States that are preserved in that condition. Our family moved here in the uh, uh, mid-1800s and uh, we're in the cotton warehousing business and uh, banking business and general business community. And I think their neighbors along the street were also in similar businesses, uh, primarily agricultural focus. We call my grandmother's house Adam Street. We always refer to it as we're going to go to Adam Street. Adam Street as a structure was just your grandmother's house. She was the reason we went to visit, and uh, she, uh, she set the rules and we followed them. If these other houses looked as grand as this one, then Memphis had some really, really prosperous, amazingly wealthy people. You know, you've seen the pictures of Napoleon Hill's house, you know, and you know that, that okay, this man had some money in late 19th century Memphis, so his house would have had to have been as fabulous as this one. So, and then having gone into the Hunt Phelan house before, you know, they took all the stuff out and everything and um, remodeled, and it's a bed and breakfast now. That was a grand house. It's fantastic, beautiful house. If you were a very wealthy family, you might have a drawing room, and this was a room that uh, was used for entertaining and really to to impress people. Uh, it was usually a very large room and uh, you might use it also for dancing and dances and things like that. Another thing that went on in the house that was very different from the way we live is there is separation. Uh, this house, if you go along to the side, the Woodruff Fontaine house, the servant's wing is lower than the rest of the house. You have to actually step up two or three steps to get into the rest of the house. And the back wing has porches all along the back. Their porches are separate from the other porches on the house, which uh, were for the Woodruffs and the Fontaine, not for the servants. There definitely is a back stair, and houses were zoned for servants as well as for the people in the house. And they were to come and really take care of your needs, but not spy on you all the time, which was a really big deal. Delivery men, uh, callers coming in all the time, no telephones, little notes being delivered. 
uh, and also, of course, having to deal with the daily activity of children and all their bumps and bruises and things like that. Um, nothing was simple. <laughs> Everything was much harder. Uh, also, don't forget, you can't just go and jump in the car. Oops. There has to be horses, there has to be a stable, and there has to be those people that take care of it, too. They had horses, and the old Sanborn insurance maps show that behind the Lee House, where we have a parking lot now, uh, sheds ran down that slope for probably ca a cow or two and the horses. And of course, there were two uh, stables here. Most houses in the 19th century would have had uh, a privy, an out outhouse in the backyard. Uh, if you were an upper-class individual, you might have a toilet that had a copper pan that was surrounding it, and uh, we didn't have oval toilets at that time, and there might be overflow into the pan. Uh, it's such a, a change from today, when our, our bathrooms have gotten so large and luxurious. Bathrooms were stinky, nasty places that people didn't like to clean so they were as small as possible. But houses would have lavatories, uh, so you would have a place to go in and wash. Uh, also, there were washstands in houses too, the typical uh, pitcher in the bowl that we see, very much used into the late 19th century. Well, it's funny because uh, many times we think about the activity alone just to run this house, just to get the fires cleaned out and started to get the food started, to get the, I mean, there had to be a full staff of people to keep the dust um, off of this exquisite furniture and the paintings that were, that were here. Um, my personal favorite is um, the fact that there's a chamber pot in every room in this house <laughs> on, this, on the upper floors, uh, and that alone was something that had to be taken care of. Most people don't know that there was a very uh, strict calling etiquette and that certain times of the week ladies would go and call on other ladies. There would be certain days that the lady of the house would have to um, accept callers. And that person would come in, they would leave their calling card. Uh, it would go on a tray and go upstairs. Uh, they would be accepted or they would be rejected. Lacking television, uh, lacking radio, things that they uh, d knew nothing about and could not imagine, a great deal of social life involved interaction with people. With women, it could involve uh, simply uh, meeting mutually for sewing parties or uh, to talk or to uh, prepare things for charitable causes. Uh, men, often it would involve business discussions, but that could be involved over card games. Of course, uh, drinking was common throughout in Memphis. Memphis has always been a town known for its music. Scores of immigrants from European countries, as well as other cities in the United States, brought along their art and cultural influences, creating the rich melting pot that has been at the core of the Memphis music story. The technology of uh, the second half of the 19th century uh, certainly makes some uh, amazing things happen. And particularly in the area of the arts, you move from um, a, uh, what would have previously been something of an elite uh, ability to hear live music. There are only certain places that could afford to have, say, an organ or to have a piano. Uh, you, you more typically had mandolin. You had mandolin societies all over the place because that's an instrument that's easily portable, it's a little cheaper and so on. So it's amazing how many mandolin clubs that you have. But with technology, you, you make a piano and you make the parts of a piano much more, let's call it widgetized. You can make many, many, many of those in mass production. So what would have been an expensive instrument by the 1870s, a piano costs $200. You can own a piano for $200, and you do see scores of people, hundreds of people, being able to have their own parlor piano, or even cheaper. You can mass produce the parts that make a little pump organ. You can have um, those instruments available for $80. So if you can't afford a piano, you can afford a little pump organ. And that made live music possible, not as a destination, but something I can have in my own home. 
Therefore, the technology then becomes uh, uh, enabling. What do you have to have? Well, you have to have someone to play the piano or play the organ. You have to have some renewable source of uh, tunes and songs. And so that sets up this whole pyramid of retail that provides you a piano or an organ, uh, sheet music. You need some new tunes next week. We heard that one. We want a new one. We can't download it. We, we have to go and buy it at a sheet music store and someone has to learn to play it. And then of course we have to have teachers, people that can teach uh, the household person or persons how to indeed play that instrument. We have several retail stores that are blossoming in the 19, late 19th century in Memphis. One of the biggest would be Emil Witzman, Witzman and Company. And we have the ledger in the Memphis Public Library of all the pianos that were sold from 1873 to the turn of the century. So we actually know the households thanks to the good archival work of our friends here. We have the uh, actual households and churches and schools where those instruments were sold. They were sold by the hundreds. They were in homes over and over again. In Memphis, uh, northern Mississippi, Arkansas, those pianos were being distributed all over the area. The presence of bands and civic bands and uh, uh, bands based upon people's ethnicity, let's say uh, uh, a group of Swiss or a group of Italian or a group of Germans, these were direct transfers from cultural desires and, and, and preferences that they brought from their mother country. Uh, brass instruments indeed were uh, big items in, in Germany, in Germanic countries, and so it's no surprise that we see these German bands being popular, and Memphis had theirs early on. We didn't have modern forms of entertainment, we did not have the phonograph, I mean the phonograph comes along later, radio comes along later, and there's a great social shift there with what happens in the parlor, but before you have that, the only way you can have live music, the way you can enjoy music, the only one way is to create it yourself. You have to home make it. I've just always been fascinated by antiquity and I saw all these buildings being torn down in this area. The urban renewal had moved into this area and a lot of older parts of Memphis, like over on Vance, and, but particularly this part, and they just were destroying so much. And I thought it was such a shame that Memphis didn't have, was not saving any of its old buildings, not a one was. So, so that's why I got so fired up about it. Just, I was seeing these things being demolished right under my nose all on Jefferson and Adams and Washington. And I thought this is just criminal to uh, all these big, you know, torn down in, in the name of progress, which wasn't progress at all. Eldridge toughed it out through thin and thinner. When the city widened Jefferson, they took down his grand grandfather's house, I think it was, Luke. They were gonna tear the whole house down. I persuaded them to just take what they, that was a huge house, take what they needed off the front, if they needed to take some of the facade off the front and leave the rest. They wanted to restore it. They said to widen the street, they would have to take something like five feet of the facade of the house, the front facade, which was removing all the most interesting parts, almost all of the Italianate work that my great aunt had been putting on there. But uh, so they did remove that and I had plans to restore it basically what as it had been but fate came along and changed my plans. One whole side of, of the house collapsed one night. I think it had been so weakened by the demolition of the, removing the facade across the front that it weakened the whole house and one whole wall collapsed on the west side. 
and uh, he was not to be deterred. He saved all the bricks, sat out there in the brawling sun and knocked all of the cement off of the bricks and saved them and then built that beautiful wall. And a lot of interesting dignitaries came to that house, you know. Teddy, when Teddy Roosevelt came to Memphis, he was an Italian that was after my grandfather had been his Secretary of War, and he came to Memphis. And because he was entertained there, people did such bizarre things, I think. My great-grandmother had all the silverware and the silver gobbles and everything that they were going to use for the great dinner party. They, they, all of that was gold-plated for the party. When I first went to visit him, he was living in the carriage house with plastic covering all the carriage doors. And he was living in there year round. Gradually, he did that building in beautiful style and then decided, I don't know whether he decided he had put enough money in there, but he certainly didn't want this house around here on Adams to go belly up, so to speak. And so he came around here and got this house. He has stayed with this through all of these years, and uh, we dubbed him the mayor of Adams Avenue a long time ago. Well, I think that, you know, he was, he was a candle in the darkness, you know. Everybody was leaving uh, rather than coming in. And it's taken many years even for his idea of uh, what the neighborhood would be like to start coming about. And he was actually the initial uh, founder of our group, Victorian Village Inc., a community development corporation that he started in the early 70s with quite a few uh, members of society that were interested in saving the neighborhood. So now we've renewed that group and uh, our plan is to continue the revitalization of the area. Much change has come to Memphis and the tendency has been to demolish everything from the past, put up what is most recent until it in turn gets removed also. So when you go back, back past the Victorian era, only a handful of structures really are left in this uh, great city of over 600,000 people. But in the Victorian era, this is the finest collection of architecture and artifacts of a way of life that is now gone, but still is a part of the life of the city visible today. I come down this street every opportunity I get, and I look at this, and I just feel connected to my home. I think the urge to save these homes and the history they contain and what they can teach a younger generation once they get old enough to pay attention is very important. And you can't let it fall down and think you can talk about it later. Uh, we're either doomed to repeat it or we can learn from it. And so the reason we want to preserve these things is we certainly want to learn from it. We've got great things uh, to learn from our unique history. I think it's one of the few places in Memphis where you can actually see how people lived in the late 19th century and the turn of the century Memphis that, you know, I hate to say it, but Memphis is not really famous for maintaining historic locations, but here's this little place that you can bring people and say, this is what Memphis was like, late 19th, turn of the century. Well, Collins Chapel is a part of Victorian Village by geography. Uh, it is a part of uh, Victorian Village by belief in the community by uh, action, words, and deeds. We in this church uh, have joined the Victorian Village family and we support the neighborhood, the community, and uh, we wish to play a role in the development of the neighborhood. Houses get patination and they go through history and time and all the families that have gone through them and their stories very much are a part of um, the past that we need to be connected with. I would love to see uh, this become a village again. I would love to see Adams Avenue be blocked off as a, a walking path. I would love to see some, some new construction that would complement these older homes. 
uh, become part of this village. I would love to see some adaptive reuse of the buildings that are taking, um, taking hold here. The concept of our development corporation is to bring a lot of residential back downtown because we think that in order to preserve these houses, they need to become the centerpiece. They need to become the jewel. Nicholas Figures reporting here with Shelby County Commissioner Heidi Schaefer, and um, I received a um, a booklet from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II regarding her Diamond Jubilee. And could you please express your support for Queen Elizabeth II regarding this booklet and her Diamond Jubilee? And could you please um, show to the international community what she extended to me, Commissioner Schaefer? Well, I just thought this was very lovely. It's the the program from her Diamond Jubilee, and you can see it's Elizabeth II, and I believe the R stands for rest. She began her reign in 1952, and it shows that her Diamond Jubilee is in 2012. Mm -hmm. And if you open it up, you see her on her coronation day and some pictures throughout the years. And there she is in her royal regalia. And it's from Buckingham Palace, and it says, I send you my grateful thanks for the words of support which you have so kindly sent on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of my accession to the throne. Elizabeth, 2012. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner Heidi Schaefer. You know, you know, it was a complete honor to receive this from, um, from Queen Elizabeth II, and it, it was just um, amazing to me. So, um, as a, you know, the youngest Shelby County Unified School Board applicant, I'm just honored, and I will continue to fight and um, help my generation to be inspired in public service. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer. And happy 2012 Diamond Jubilee to Her Majesty.